So, dear audience, uh, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed lunch and your first inspirational journey outside. And of course, the sun. It wasn't easy to get you in, like always. But we, I, we have a good afternoon. We're going to have a nice time right now. I reassure you. Everything this afternoon revolves uh, around the topic reforestation, regeneration, and deer management in the future. The following um, uh, panel lecture should give a broad uh, overview of the biggest questions in reforestation, which are reforestation, which are what are the biggest threats to successful uh, reforestation? How big is the role of deer damage now, and how will it be in the future? Or how are deer populations changing, and how do we monitor them? It's a problem. Uh, is reforestation without protection economical, e economically feasible without, uh, with, with the current deer population? Or uh, what is the role of hunting versus protection methods? Yeah, a bunch of questions we have for the senior policy officer at FACE from the European Federation for Hunting and Conservation. Ladies and gentlemen, please extend a warm welcome to Sabrina Dietz. Yes, uh, good afternoon everyone, also from my side, and thank you very much for the kind introduction. And I'm now very happy to talk more about and discuss more about uh, reforestation, forest regeneration, deer management, and also the important roles have hunters have to achieve an appropriate and healthy balance. I would like to introduce or I'd like to start my presentation with quickly introducing um, what FACE is and who we are. So FACE is the European Federation for Hunting and Conservation. We are based in Brussels and have members from 37 countries, which are mainly the national hunting associations from the EU 27 um, member states, but also um, yeah, from other non-EU countries. And we basically represent the interests and values of hunters and hunting in front of the EU institutions and um, in different stakeholder platforms. And our day-to-day -day work evolves around policies, regulations or guidelines that would that then have an impact on, on hunting and nature conservation. And you might ask yourself why FACE is so important. Well, in the end, 80% of all regulations that impact nature conservation and hunting are coming from Brussels. So FACE work is, is very important for, for rural stakeholders on, on the ground. Um, yes, we have seen that already quite a bit. So the most interesting um, policy at the moment for FACE is the EU forestry strategy when it comes to ungulate management and, and I won't go into detail because we have already heard a lot about different policies impacting forestry. But for FACE, uh, the most important question was how are these policies impacting ungulate management in, in Europe? And interestingly enough, um, in the EU forestry strategy, our, our wildlife management is only mentioned once and in a very short sentence. But ungulate management is picked up in the guidelines. The Closer to Nature Forestry Guideline, the, the Primary and Old Growth Forest Working Document and the Forest Urban Agroforestry Guidelines. And these guidelines are at the moment prepared by the European Commission together with member states and relevant stakeholders to, to help member states um, implementing the f um, EU forestry strategy. And for us, as FACE, um, f um, when ungulate management in touch is touched, we only want a really um, light framework, because I think you and me, we can agree that actions and solutions concerning forestry and ungulate management are best found at national level or even regional or local level. But why? Um, is ungulate management so important? And as you might see on the map, these white spots here in Europe, these are the only areas where you cannot find any deer species. And these are mainly the really high altitude areas of Europe or some coastal areas or, um, or islands. But all over Europe, you can find one or at least um, at least one or also several deer species, um, with roe deer, of course, um, dominating, but and wild boar as an ungulate, and uh, moose, especially in the northern areas um, of Europe. 
Um, and if we quickly look into the past, so within the last 50 to 60 years, we could see an incredible recovery of Europe's large mammals and um, also of our deer species, and with the red deer um, displaying a population increase of 400%. So how will this look in the future? And I think we can see that this increase will most likely not stop, especially in the southern parts of Europe and in Fennoscandinavia, there's, there's room for, for more. And the causes for this increase of deer populations, they are very diverse, ranging from milder climates to um, more productive landscapes to rural abandonment and the lack of large predators in some areas of Europe. Um, in a completely natural ecosystem, such kind of overabundance of a single species would only occur in a very short time, and then nature would start regulating itself. But if we nowadays talk about um, overabundance, um, this is a completely human-made judgment, and um, it occurs when the overabundant species is affecting human or human livelihoods, but if it's also affecting the fitness of its own species, but also having an impact um, on other species and thereby causing completely dysfunctional ecosystems. And these increased deer populations um, or the not appropriate management of these deer populations, you can also, of course, um, see that it has a huge impact on forest regeneration, and, and you know my, uh, you know best on how much different and how much different levels the deer populations can impact um, um, forest regeneration, starting from the impact on on a single tree, where you can, uh, when there's an increased uh, browsing pressure, you have of course an increased death of seedlings. Um, uh, reduction of growth, misshapen trees, and so on. And it goes further to influencing the, the forest herb community and also altering food web interactions up to whole mod modification of, um, of habitats where single deer species or populations can alter the vegetation structure and alter the nutrient cycle where they choose on browsing on, on valuable tree species while completely leaving others. And this, of course, has also a huge economic impact. And these are only some numbers uh, from, from, uh, from the past, because it's really hard, in fact, to get an European overview, because these kind of numbers are very fragmented and hard to access. But if you only look at the numbers of Sweden, the moose browsing damage alone adds up to 50 million euros um, per year. Um, when we focus now on ungulate damage and its causes, it's quite interesting because science found out that there can be up to 80 distinct factors that can influence um, the feeding behavior of deers. And I've only listed um, some of the uh, most important ones, which can start from the level of disturbance in the forest. So the more uh, disturbance there is in the forest, it's the more stressful it is for the deer. They need uh, more uh, nutrition intake, which then in the end can lead up to increased browsing. Um, but also the lack of alternative browsing or grazing uh, opportunities, climate change, hunting regimes as well, as, um, and the broader landscape, so how productive is the broader landscape, can influence um, the, the damage caused by deer. But one important thing is also the level of dialogue. The level of dialogue between the hunting community and the forestry sector. Because in the field we see quite often if there's a lack of dialogue, if there's a lack of uh, cooperation, this leads to actions um, that are most often not beneficial um, for uh, valuable forest ecosystems. So we have seen now um, a lot of that there can be a lot of different causes um, um, for the damage, and sometimes it is even not the level of the, the deer damage that is um, causing, uh, the level of the deer population that is causing the damage. Um, but then we also need to find solutions, and solutions together with all relevant stakeholders. And these actions or solutions, they can um, be done at very different scales, um, starting from protecting the single tree uh, with repellents or plastic covers, to um, looking at the broader regional landscapes while implementing adaptive harvest management programs, coordinating different hunting areas, but also 
having um, actions on the vegetation side, which is as, um, um, also very important. If we focus on hunting versus other protection measures, hunting is quite often, um, or in many uh, situations, the best um, and readily available um, measure or tool to reduce the numbers of deers on a large scale, uh, but also influencing in a bit more local manner while, uh, by influencing density, demography and distribution. And depending on the level of the damage or where it is located, you can use adaptable hunting forms such as interval hunting or hunting as focused areas to reduce the damage. And quite often it is um, s um, still the best uh, trade-off between economy, so the costs of the measure and um, the efficiency. But, and this is one key message I really want to bring across, it is never hunting versus other protection measures, it is hunting with other protection measures. Because only if, if hunting is coordinated with measures on, on the forest ecosystem, on the vegetation, uh, we can create uh, future fit and resilient forest ecosystems. So here you can see the phase recommendations and you can see that they're really broad, but it is because also at EU level we advocate that actions and solutions should be found at local or regional level. Um, but we strongly advocate that wildlife management, deer management is integrated into the forest management plans. Um, quite often adaptive harvest management plans are um, beneficial if they are coordinated together with the hunting community and the forest sector. Um, and as I said before, sometimes the solution cannot be only found within the forest stand, and that you need to look at the broader landscape, at um, the, the, yeah, the agricultural land around, and also take into consideration the social um, and ecological context. And there, if needed, um, yeah, in including farmers, including the tourist sectors, when it comes to, to disturbance in the forest, I think uh, here in, in the mountain areas, disturbance can be quite high to deer populations. So the tourist sector is also um, really well relevant. So to conclude my presentation, FACE believes that hunting is and will be key uh, to ensure uh, multifunctional, resilient, but also valuable forest ecosystems. We, we advocate for more biodiversity in forest without forgetting the economic side of forests, because in the end, um, the rural stakeholders, they need to live with the forest, but of course also from the forest. So we, we wish to, uh, yeah create more dialogue, um, and now I'm very happy to discuss with you um, and finding best practice solutions. Thank you very much. Please stay on. Please, stay. Please take a seat. Thank you. Thank you, Sabrina, for your highly interesting keynote. This was a good impulse uh, for the next uh, panel discussion we're going to have with several experts. First, please join, join me on the stage, Tom Fox. Tom Fox is founder of Fox Industry, Forestry, sorry. <laughs> 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 you're gonna grow, you can sit there. Tom, you're too big to stay. <laughs> and uh, he's a US forest management and forest equipment provider. So uh, next to me, please join um, Stig Ulof Holm, he's associate an applause, please, uh, Associate Professor at the Department of Ecology and Environment Sciences at the Umea University in Sweden. Nice to have you. So next, uh, Florian Noll, please come up to the stage. Leader service from Leader Service of the Bayerische Staatsforste from Germany, Bavaria. And last but not least, of course, you know him all, Uwe Seyer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, today he has restricted talking time. He's manager of FSC Germany, as you all already know. <laughs> That's why I have you here. <laughs> no, it's okay. Good job. Good job. Uh, we, w we want to start with uh, Professor uh, Stig Ulof, uh, because he wanted to add something to the discussion we had in the morning about CO2 storage of, of forests. And you have something, uh, something important for us. Mm. Right. Uh, first, I will thank you for the invitation to this uh, interesting mm. conference that you had arra arranged this. That what I want to add to the discussion is the, that we had to consider the time factor much more, because we have just uh, 30 years until uh, 
2050 when we should had uh, decreased the uh, emissions of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere to net zero. And then uh, if we look at, for example, the, the cycle for forest in, in northern Sweden, it could be 80 to 100 years. So if you cut a tree and, as, and just take out a little part of it for soil material, it's about 15% or so, and the rest is uh, polluted to the atmosphere, it will take until the year 2100 to get it back. And it's uh, about 50 years too, too late. So it doesn't help that we regenerate in the, in the, in the long run. And if we don't, uh, so that we have to sort of say, decrease the logging, but also uh, more of selective logging, because then this decrease in growth will be less uh, among the larger trees. The canopies will close together much faster than if we have a clear cut and start to generate with small plants. They will grow up in time. So it all, it's not about to decrease the logging, but also use more of selective logging for, okay. for this purpose. So th th that was the only thing I had to add. No, that's not the only thing. That's <laughs> uh, we have to keep this in mind because of climate change. Maybe this will be a, a broader discussion in the future that we have to decrease. That's bad news for the industry. We have to decrease logging. So, so that's his statement. So we have to, we have to take it serious. Um, whatever happens in the future. Thank you very much. So, uh, but now to the uh, topic of reforestation and uh, deer management. First, uh, Sabrina, I want to come back to your uh, presentation. Yeah. Um, so to sum it up, it's simply we have too much deers in Europe or also in North America. It's this, is this the point? Well, um, I tried to explain with my presentation that overabundance is really then occurring when it impacts objectives. Objectives of forestry, um, but also, of course, human livelihoods directly by, by looking at uh, vehicle um, collisions, for example, that are caused by increasing deer. But in the end, um, there is a huge complex complexity, complexity when it comes to the damage um, by deer caused in a forest, because um, in fact, only a high, uh, a low, a very low amount of deer can cause damage in the in in the forest if um, there is no alternative browsing if there's a lot of disturbance so it's not only um, always the the overabundance or the level of the deer species um, that is causing uh, the, the damage and we, no. we need to see it on a more holistic uh, with a whole I, more I understand, approach. but uh, but you said in a natural system there would there wouldn't be as much deers as we have right now. So so why don't we simply? It's a question to to Florian Noll. Uh, why don't we simply shoot more <laughs> Bambis, uh, the father of Bambi? Well, why don't we simply shoot more? <laughs> I know no one no one takes this word in his mouth. No one is. You speak well of managing deers, but in in at the end is shooting. Very true, very true. Um, actually, we are bound by laws. We are bound by hunting laws, by forestry laws, which, for example, in Bavaria state that um, the natural regeneration has to grow up in the most part without any artificial means of protecting it. So for us, that means we have to be professional, we have to be purposeful in our hunting. But um, we are not the policy makers. Even as a state forest company, we are not the policy makers. Um, we just follow the rules set out by governments, um, set out or follow the rules by the state. And there's a maximum number of deer that we can harvest um, throughout the year, throughout or within a period of so three years for some species. And it's a slow process of getting those is numbers it so up. Slow? Uh, net, net, uh, to be precise, you, you, are you actually hunting what you allow, what you are allowed to do? Yes. I okay. Okay. I we we are. Um, I can well speak in for the state managed lands. In probably ninety percent, um, we fulfill our quota to the last animal. Okay. How is it in the U.S. or in Canada? Uh, well, we also. We also do quite well with our quotas, but we can, <laughs> we can, uh, we also will manage uh, male, female, and in per each area. So, what, uh, how many would be allowed to 
if you want to control the population, then we would we would shoot more females and so give more permits. That's interesting. Off record, I heard that that it's not so easy to to manage population because it's not because uh, the the deers are quite intelligent and they. And it's nowadays we, we have a we have a we have a, 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 a forest which is denser than it was before. So, so it's easier in Austria. That's what I've heard. It's easier for them to hide, and it's not so easy to to manage them. Well, maybe maybe I can answer to that. Yes. Um, there was a big event. Um, well, most of the Europeans will remember about 35 years ago. Uh, it was a big storm called Wipke, and well, I guess all foresters pretty much realized that we can't go on with forest management the way we have been doing it up to then. So we started rebuilding stands, uh, making them more resilient, resistant against storms, and we started under, under planting, fill planting, we started working with multiple species, and therefore we increased the habitat quality uh, quite significantly. And I think this is what Sabrina was bringing out in her presentation as well. The habitat quality all over Europe has gotten so much better in the last 30, 40 years, whether it's because of uh, forest management, but also because of the availability of crops in the field and stuff. And so deer numbers have been skyrocketing. And um, for us as, well, managers, it's, it, there might be, a, might be a time lag before we catch up and we actually see the effects. Because um, it's, well, if I shoot a large number of deer every year, it takes about five to 10 years until I see an effect. Really? Well, if I, if I rely on natural regeneration, for example, that has to develop. Um, I have to find something on the ground first. If it's planting, I can see the effect quite uh, quite rapidly. Because I mean, um, well, if I have no brows on my planted stands, then well, I must have done something right. Whether it's um, reducing the number of deer or pushing them into other areas, I guess that's what mm -hmm. that might be the other effect. Yeah, so we will also have uh, you know create deer wintering areas. So we would, in, especially in Maine, we would we would preserve certain areas in the winter to kind of consolidate them. Okay, uh, we want to learn more about uh, the different meth meshes and uh, you have in, in different countries. Uh, what's about liability? Who is liable when, when there's this deer browsing? What is the situation in Sweden, for example? Stig Ulof. Well, um, in Sweden we have, uh, say it's a long country, so it's uh, uh, dif different conditions, of course, in the south. and it's We have many deer species there. Uh, red deer and and uh, and uh, rotor roe deer and not only the moose in the north it's only almost only the moose and we have also other winter conditions so uh, it's uh, if we should have some uh, say quick fix it could be di difficult but what i suggest would be the best is that we will start to discuss some some rules about regeneration of forests Because in, in, in before lunch we we're talking about uh, to, to get the forest more climate resilience uh, with mixed of species, but I think that much of the solution on with this uh, increase of browsing and so on, it would be also to put some rules that do, when you regenerate the forest, depending on site condition, of course you can't have mixed forest everywhere, but in in those sites when you can regenerate and it's uh, well each other spruce, each other uh, uh, pine and so on, and, and, and have larger space between the, uh, the plants and, and uh, allow uh, natural regeneration of deciduous trees and not, and not then uh, clean it off down to 10% according to the FSC rules in, in Sweden. If we could do it in that way pra in praxis, I think we could also solve some of the problems with that What, what can the moose eat when we have cleaned off all the deciduous trees? Yes, the pine is left. Mm -hmm. So that's the situation, actually. So I, I can yeah. contribute to that a little bit with what's happening in, in the U.S. Um, and we started this at the end of the discussion just before lunch uh, with, the, with the policy. So we have federal, federal policy, but then also state policy. And to, to look at also deer populations, New York State, and how they, and how they manage um, 
private land, a lot of private landowners in, in the US. And so they would have, um, in New York, they would set, if you want to enter into their tax exemption program, you would have to manage according, they actually uh, will tell you how much density you can harvest in each diameter class. So you have to have a stratific forest stratification. So, so you, you're, you're managing in all diameter classes up to uh, the bigger trees. So, so uh, deer browsing is also due to mismanagement of forests? That's what I hear. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, I, mean, I would, I would. It's yeah. technique. No, yeah, it's I, mismanagement. I find you have less seedlings, less seedlings can, uh, can get eaten. I would go back to your first question, liability, responsibility. And I mean, I'm coming from Germany. Germany is a bit maybe different than other countries, but I think it's always worth to look into the concrete legislation of a country because that is, would be my starting point. If you would ask me reliability, responsibility, yeah. I would always say also in context of the whole conference, it's the forest owner, whoever that is, private state, whoever. Mm -hmm. And if, if the starting point is forest, then I would say, okay, what is needed for a resilient forest? And then you can plant, but better before planting, you, would you should go for uh, natural regeneration because that is, for the moment, a more resilient idea in answering questions around biodiversity, climate change, whatever. Resilient forestry. Resilient is more, is natural regeneration. Natural regeneration, what does that mean in, in regards to hunting? And then it starts with killing, you could say killing, I would say balance between a, a, a system out of balance. And the problem in Germany is that we have a legislation, a forest legislation, which is connected to the forest owner, and a hunting legislation, which is connected to deer management and to hunting licenses, you could say, but in Germany it's a bit different system. And the disconnect between those two, that causes the problem. What okay. is then the solution? In Germany, I would say, I mean, if, if there is one thing to be done in German forests on an ecological side or in an, on a balanced side, killing the raw deer or hunting, hunting, hunting more. And what I hear is here, okay, we've, we have fulfilled figures, but you can't, you can't count, you can't count raw deer. So what would you do then in Germany? My recommendation, FSC's recommendation, build a fence 10 to 10 meter, and see what happens. So starting with an evaluation, what is the situation somewhere on a concrete place? And if there is the same situation outside and inside that fence, you could say, okay, no need for extreme hunting. But if there is an imbalance, if you see trees growing, native trees growing in the fence and outside there's nothing, then this is a clear indication, okay, you have to hunt, you have to work on that, regardless whether you have fulfilled some figures of deer populations that you anyway can't count. So this is our, our concept of, of, of approaching the problem. Okay, it comes more from the, from the owner. It comes completely and from and the natural forest data. perspective. And we need more data, more precise data, more better information. But it starts always from the, from the forest perspective and yeah. never from the deer perspective. Okay, uh, Florian has to... Well, some, uh, I support response. that 100%. Um, fulfilling numbers uh, does not solve the problem, but uh, one has to take into consideration where these numbers come from. And I was saying beforehand that, well, we don't make the rules, um, we just follow the rules. But, for example, in Bavaria, what, is it, what are the numbers actually based upon? That's the question. And um, there's a vegetation sampling done every three years. And out of the results of, of that vegetation sampling, we come up together with the government, we as the hunters, landowners, land managers, we come up uh, with the numbers uh, for the next three-year period. So there is actually some evidence, or that there is some evidence there um, mm. that relies to what you were saying. It's not a fence. No, it's tracts, and um, mm -hmm. we use those. Because, um, well, of course, um, we won't have a landscape. Or we don't, I guess nobody wants a landscape without any deer. We just want them regulated enough so our main mandate, which is the resilient and resistant uh, forest, can grow. Okay. Uh, Sabrina, a simple question. Uh, what is the goal? Which figure do we want to have? How many deers do we want to have in Europe? Or is it depending on each country? But how many deers are good and how many are bad? Yes, I, I think this is really 
um, member state. Uh, it de depends from member state to member state, but also from region to region. And this is why we advocate so much on, on the level of the European Commission to leave this deer management and the forest management up to the member states, because you cannot set rules or or clear numbers on, on a European level. This is not possible. We need to respect the diversity of, Eu of Europe's legislation, which is, okay. a, which is a big point on who is responsible um, for, for the damage. In uh, the European Commission, they always talk about game balance. We, we don't like this word game because it implies that hunting, the hunting community is responsible because, first of all, not every game species is causing damage. And sometimes we have ungulates, like in, in Poland you have the moose, which is strictly protected, or there is no open hunting season, which is causing damage. Um, but it's not under the resp responsibility of, of the hunters because it's strictly protected. So we want to talk about ungulate management and we really advocate for yeah, for yeah, not clear definitions, not clear regulations from the side of the European Commission. Uh, Stig Olof, how many deer or goose is are need well Sweden need Sweden? Uh, I, I would say that um, of course it depends on which which part of Sweden we are talking about. Uh, in the north, for example, we have still a lot of say uh, the hunters gathering a lot of food for for the households and the countryside people there. So it's important also for, as an um, ecological uh, meat, uh, so to say, for, for the local population. And the forest companies, they just want to, to shoot them down. So it's a conflict going on there between also private forest owners that need, want to have more of, of, of a moose because they're partly dependent on it. And it, I mean, a lot of, uh, People have moved from northern Sweden before, but they come back and uh, to the hunting season, and it's socially important so also this. So in, I think that in many places in, in the north we have too few of, of moose, mm. while in other parts it's, it could be if you combine many deer, so, uh, for example in, Swe in southern Sweden, it has an apparent effect on, on, on the vegetation and, on, and mm -hmm. so on. And of course we, had, we shouldn't have as many as we had in the 1980s when it became a lot of traffic accidents and so on. Okay. We cannot have that level. But I would say that <laughs> if you put it, uh, an average in, in northern Sweden, maybe six, seven uh, moves per Per, s per square kilometer in the winter, in the winter uh, population. Okay. I mean, in, in, the, in the area of uh, uh, where I live in Westerbotten County, in many places in the coast there, it's down to 3.3 moose uh, in winter population per uh, thousand hectares. So it's, it, they, have, they have shut it down. And it, it, it depends on that, that it's owned by forestry companies while in, in the southern part of the county and the northern part we have about 9 to 10. It's too much, uh, but it because it this, it, it, the decision is taken by smaller forest owners. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not have to, it's too much to do with ecolo ecological reasons or browsing intensity. It's much up to who, who owns the land okay, and what, 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 what they want to do. So the, the authorities have taken a hand from it. I mean, it, it, 10 years ago when we shifted these rules, before that it was uh, the county council, so to say. It was politicians that took the decisions, but okay. now it's put down to the companies, the forest owners. Okay. okay. Tom? I would say, I would say that uh, in, in Maine we also have the moose population. This is also uh, starting to change. It's starting, the moose population is moving further north. We've got um, heavy uh, tick problems with the ticks uh, ah. getting on the moose. Um, it's a problem the for the moose? It's a problem for the moose. Too oh, many I ticks, it's too it's warm. It's such warming a big up, animal. okay? It's warming up and then the, the ticks are on the moose. The, we have wildlife management districts. So we're not, um, our, you know how you have uh, the rights to walk through everybody's property? And every, every citizen has the right for a hunting license, okay? We, at, at, at Maine, it's uh, 10 years old. You can shoot big game. So we send our children to camps to yeah. get their hunting license, you know? Oh. And, uh, and uh, this, is part of our, this is part of our culture, okay? 
but the the um, the wildlife biologists for the state are are the ones that are um, choosing the numbers. They have the dial on the population, okay? And each wildlife management district would have different um, quotas. So for example, the farmers are in Northern Maine where we have big broccoli fields, potatoes, and a huge moose population. This is where you're allowed to shoot more moose. And, we've, and, and this is where we have hunters going to where the, where the problem is, where the populations are highest density. Give out more permits, go there. It's not a privatized decision. I just want, I have, maybe it's a silly question for all of you, but it's a, it's a system, it's a system, it's a forest. In this system, what's the role of a deer, of a moose, what's his role? Or is a, is a forest without such animals thinkable and will grow and have a better time than before? What's, what's, what's the role? In biology, everything has a role. Yeah, but I'm not sure whether this is the right question. Sorry for that, but I would say uh, I would say uh, okay. Thank you. It was silly. <laughs> no, it was not silly. So you I'm can't answer. I, I like I like naive questions, but my naive <laughs> answer on 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 this kind thank of you. thinking is <laughs> is what I mean. I disagree with Sabrina in a way that is it is it is it a problem to say no. There is too many European regulations. We are not able. We should not um, put out policies in that regards. I disagree with that. What would it be? And this is a, a naive point from my side. Then yeah. saying simply, the starting point, the naive starting point, is a is a healthy forest. You could say a resilient forest, yeah. a climate stable forest, whatever. If that is a, if that would be an agreed principle. Then I would say, then it's not a difficult task to say, okay, we need to hunt as much as long as the balance is there. If there is a balance, it's impossible to extinct raw deer in, in, your, in Middle Europe. Yeah, it's you impossible. Know, maybe and therefore, what, but what is the right balance? And then I hear figures, counting figures. I mean, for me, it's annoying because at the end, it's not a question about, it, it's the starting point is a healthy forest. Yeah. If it's not, if, if this is, if this is not an agreeable concept, yeah. then we can go home here. You know, my question was naive, but it not, but it wasn't stupid because no, wha I just want to say because we are living all in an age of in extinction. What we are doing worldwide, we are extinct. Mm. We are living in the fifth extinction we had in the, in the history of this planet, and that's due to mankind, due to agriculture and 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 deforestation and this stuff. So so, and if I say to people so to s people on the street, hey, we are living in the age of distinction okay there is an insect in this jungle do i need it no i need cows to eat and some uh, and sheep i like the wool that's okay but the other animals so the question isn't so it's it's na it's not so naive no, no, why do we want to live with the deers but we we're living not in a situation of having an old growth forest yeah. overall we have farming we have urbanization and we, we want them and it's impossible to to extinct one yeah. year. It's impossible. Yeah, I mean, yeah, has I'm been not sure. I'm not sure. Maybe. I think I think there has been tests, scientific tests. It's not possible. Yeah. I mean, you try to extinct, and then you fi finally on islands there has been yeah. a scientific approaches. At the end, they find out it's possible. I mean, you always estimate now it's done, and then you have another hundred that you that you that you find if you go. But I saw Ireland, who is pretty empty. Yeah, but an anyway, the, the, the problem is with these figures. I mean, if you if you start with figures, okay, now I have done my job with figures. Then you uh, you can be sure that there's still raw deer in the forest. The starting point is if it if yeah. is this is the the raw deer damaging natural processes that are urgently needed mm -hmm. to to create resilient forests. Mm. And I also when you read I when you I see I think the uh, geographical decision making, okay, where you have different situations throughout the EU, we have different situations throughout the United States. And each state and each uh, wildlife management zone district is in charge of their own decision making. But would you disagree with my suggested concept, saying the starting point is a is a is a as much possible resilient forestry, including natural okay. regeneration? Yeah, anyway. you can d you can do that, but you need to do that in a way that uh, you have flexibility for that region. Fair enough. Yes. Yeah. 
Uh, can Sabrina I, can I, wanted yeah, answer on, on your comment. Answer. Space <laughs> does not want no regulations at all at EU level. But at the moment, you com the European Commission is trying to explain this complexity of ungulate uh, forest balance uh, within one of the guidelines. And uh, this paragraph is less than half a page long. Um, so they oversimplify um, the, the situation. They do not take into consideration the diversity of European forests. And yes, we want light frameworks. We want that, uh, that there is a good uh, balance between uh, deer and, and forest and that there should be a better integration um, of deer management into the forest uh, management plans. Um, but in such a way that leads to flexibility in, in member states. So yes, it is very important. It is important to have regulations and a good framework, but you, from Brussels you, you cannot because they tend to restrict, they tend to put numbers on on on, on certain yeah, tiers. They they want to define the responsibility of who who's responsible or ability for the the, the game uh, the angulate damage uh, with within a guideline. But you cannot do it because uh, the legislation in in Europe is, is so different. So we do advocate for for a good framework that respects the the regional differences. Okay, yeah. okay, I, I have. Um Long ago, a question from from a gentleman here in in the back row. Uh, uh, wait, wait. H here's the microphone. Could you please say? <laughs> <laughs> could you please introduce yourself? Yes, yes. I introduce myself. I'm Serge, coming from France. Uh, I'm just a question. I'm very surprised. Nobody uh, speak about predators, uh, the wolf, for example. Yeah. You don't speak about. We have no. In your oh, it's a big topic. Yeah, yeah. No, but we didn't. We, we can do. Yeah, yeah. It's a big topic. It's, you open a big, a big, a big discussion. Yes. I, I wanted. Re I wanted to avoid it, but <laughs> 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 it's it's a really big, big issue also in Austria right now. Okay. Ah. Sabrina? And naturally, I need to answer that because, of course, large carnivores is, is one of the name, main topics also for face. Uh, we see, and I think science supports us, that large carnivores, especially in, in Central Europe, where our landscapes are so intensified, so productive, where the, the, uh, the winters are so, so mild, that large carnivores would not have a big impact. When you look at Germany, even, even 10,000 of wolves would not have the possibility to re regulate our deer. Um, it is more large carnivores have more impact if if the climate is harsher if if the the, the surrounding areas are, are less productive of okay. course um, um, large carnivores they they change behavior and that that influence also the the hunting and the management but um, I think it is yeah naive to think that the large carnivores will be the solutions okay. to to the problem of as the, the as long as the the years are need langsamer, schneller, are faster than the sheep, because <laughs> that's the problem. The farmers they lose a lot of sheep. Okay, that's not a solution. The wolf. I think it will not solve any any increased deer populations, especially in in, in Central Europe, in, in Germany. Thank you for this Poland. good question. So, the French did arrive. That's good, <laughs> because yesterday you didn't manage it. Next time you know where we are. Okay. <laughs> You'll find us. It's not only Paris. I yeah, I can add something to that. Uh, you know, in um, if we have a, a, an, an, a larger pro uh, productivity in the landscape, as you mentioned, then uh, we will have more of herbivores, and we have also a possibility to the, the, the say the conflict between two-legged and four-legged hunters would decrease. So, for example, in Sweden, if we should allow more of thick uh, regrowth of young forest and so on, and more deciduous trees and so on, we have more fodder for for moose and for for deer and so on, and then it could could allow little more wolves uh, in the top, so to say, of this uh, this pyramid. So the, then it could be a practical way also to solve a little bit of the conflict on about the moose, who should, uh, should eat it, wolves or, okay. or, 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 or humans. Okay, we had now had a, a long discussion about the deer population and the, and the moose and whatever. Uh, very interesting, but now I want to talk about the, uh, what, are, what are the measures we take again against deer browsing. What are we doing in each uh, country? What are we doing in the, 
in the in the US or in Canada this year you it's it's Trico yeah. it's starting we're, we're starting that's why we're we meeting here to be honest yes absolutely we need and, you and but we're in a we're in a unique position in uh north in the northeast and in Maine in particular uh we've got a forest management company we we actually can come and listen and and learn from the from these different discussions and then I can come home and go right in the field and implement so I'm writing, we, in Maine, we have um, a lot of forest landowners. Uh, we have, uh, it's about 5% smaller than Austria, the state of Maine. So we're very, we're very close in size. Mm -hmm. With the exception is the amount of small landowners is huge. We have, we have 86,000 individual landowners okay. at 10 acres and less. We have two hundred thousand. Okay. Yeah, so so we are so we are now involved with uh, feet on the ground, writing these management plans and then implementing them. Okay, and, so and until now, how did you manage? Until uh, now, we frozen. were managing with both hunting and and uh, tubes. We've got a lot of tubes for planting. Ah, and, okay, and these plastic tubes. Yeah, and it's. Uh, Expensive and and not uh, not a real long term solution at a larger scale. And you have um, a lot of plastic in the wood in the forest. Yeah, it w we're working on projects much like what we discussed this morning. Um, uh, in addition, we also have some genetically modified, uh, you know, chestnuts, American chestnuts, bringing them up. We're taking we're taking small. Uh, <coughs> Clear cuts, and then introducing migrating species. Okay, what are the measures taken in in Bavaria? Well, we try to focus on well professional hunting management. Um, some of the some of the uh, measures have been talked about. Interval hunting, we try to take that seriously. Um, like when I talk about hunting here, I'm talking about roe deer and wild boar. Um, Red deer and chamois is a different question. Um, there's different measures there. But um, we try to uh, focus on communal hunts involving the public. So in the fall, for example, um, or we start, in the, we start in the summer with communal hunts. Um, lots of hunters get together. Um, the animals are not moved. And then once the fall progresses, we go into the driven hunts. So sometimes up to 100 people. So you have the disturbance on the site for a very short period of time, and you harvest a lot of animals. And if you are effective in that, um, you can, well, first of all, reduce the pressure and harvest a large number of animals in mm. at one day. And, and beside hunting, what are you doing? Well, if that fails, then um, we have to rely on Trico. Mm. <laughs> well, yeah. We've Do we have it on tape? <laughs> 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 no, actually, it's, we looked it up, and I was quite surprised by the numbers myself. I mean, um, it's, it's the application you, that makes it... When you yeah. set quotas, uh, it's a little bit different, the structure. I mean, in the U.S., the people own the uh, game. It's the, the, the animals and the hunting is the public. And then we have we can have permission to go hunt on, on the private forest lands. Uh, and then all of our quotas are set by the biologists. So it's very geographically driven, right? How does that work here? Well, um, in Germany, um, wildlife does not have an owner. Wild is herrenlos. That's the, the German definition. So if you have the right to hunt in this area, then you own the animal after you have killed it. Then it's yours. But until then, no one owns the animals. So the quotas are set, as I said, we have a vegetation sampling. every. That's for Bavaria now, just one state regulation. Um, vegetation sampling every three years, conducted uh, by the Ministry of Forests. They run transects through every hunting area in the States, over 1,500, 2,000 
So they do a browsing assessment and on that browsing assessment, they conclude, okay, the numbers have been so and so many deer harvested and the browse shows that it's still too high, like 3%, 4% is mm -hmm. acceptable, everything above that, not acceptable. So you up the numbers. But there's a difference to do there's a difference to the system in in the U.S. Exactly, you have, you, as you said, you have a licensing system. You can buy a license for hunting in Germany. If you own forests bigger than 75 hectares, you area. own the right on that area right. to hunt. And for community-owned forests, for example, you can sell it. You can rent it to someone, and that that is a huge that is difference. a huge difference. It's a yeah. huge yeah. difference for because sure. there is not enough for from sure. our perspective. There's not enough incentives. To, to do, ha I mean, if there's a competition, and if if one ha ha has, a, if, if, if you go for hunting and if you're licensed for hunting and someone else has the same license, there's an incentive to be the first one. Otherwise, what are you doing with, with, uh, with your harvest reports? You have so many deer in a certain area, you harvest so many in a certain area. Um, how does that sort of ex extrapolate through the through the years? The harvesting reports uh, we file, or every hunting area owner or manager files those, um, sends them to the usually to the municipal or the well county government. Mm -hmm. They compile them up, and then we have a compilation for the state, and the numbers are. Um, and does ah. that coincide with the with the browsing data? Well, the browsing data. Um, well, of course, yes. Yeah. Yeah. This, is, mean, where this, yeah. Is, uh, this yeah. is where you. That's basically yeah. where it comes together. Uh, I mean, we after three years, um, there's a mm -hmm. we draw the line and say, okay, there's so and so many deer are harvested, broken down to the individual hunting area. May I interrupt for for a moment? But we have a question from our Swedish friend. Yeah, it's starting to heat up, so maybe I should put some more fire yes. wood on. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. please do it. Yeah. Like it juicy. From a practical point of view, I do an oak plantation. We also have a quota system in Sweden. And when the moose gets that, the quota is filled. And I can apply to the state, and three months later they give me the answer. Yeah, maybe you can shoot that moose. It's not there then. It's, it's, it's too late. But yeah, it's too late. So, I mean, it doesn't work with but when he comes back? regulation systems. You need to do it when it's there. That's one part. Uh, I also experience, and this is for Sabrina, that there is an increase in people that say we shouldn't hunt at all. It, it's wrong to kill animals. And I think they are getting stronger and stronger in, in the European Union. So I would say we're getting a bigger and bigger problem uh, doing this. Yeah. Yeah, I can it's maybe answer on it. I think it's it's not the amount of people, it's how loud they are. And that's the problem. Because um, if, if you do, uh, if you uh, survey the, the whole population of Sweden, hunting is, is very much accepted. Uh, also, our Dutch member did, did uh, a survey on f via the whole, we hold the population. And surprisingly, it, it doesn't fit with, with what the loud people, especially on social media, say that hunting is, is not accepted. Hunting is, is, a, is a bad way to, to manage nature. Uh, if you look at the broader uh, society, it, the, the hunting su is surprisingly rather um, accepted. Should he work more on, so on social media? Yes, uh, we, we do that. We, we now have a specialized person because it's, it's, it's so important. It's, it's a battlefield out there. And so we, we need to battle with fake news. It, it, social media gets more and more important. So by the way, this discussion is open for uh, all of you. <laughs> Any more questions? In the audience, okay, uh, the lady in the back row. Well, uh, about uh, light in the fire, <laughs> uh, I'm Elena Martinez, I'm a member of End Ecoside Sweden, and I think you didn't get an answer to your very good question about the mass extinction of species in the world. Uh, of course, if you see a forest as a production unity, you don't need the uh, moose or other animals eating it, uh, but <laughs> you, ha you have to understand that a, a forest is an ecosystem, and uh, what do we have, uh, why are we needing moose or deers or other animals? Um, 
of course, they are very tasty to eat, and it's a very good quality meat. And uh, according to the EPCC, is uh, a very good source of meat. Uh, but other people could say that they have the right to exist because this is their, their world too. We, we people, <laughs> we are uh, expanding ourselves all over the world, destructing uh, nature, but it's, it's coming back to us. It's a part, this, this crisis of climate change and loss of biodiversity is going to, to uh, shake us too, because we are just one species in this world and we need all the others to have a functioning planet. So it's not that we can decide, oh, we, we, have, uh, we can afford uh, five moose and three uh, animals. I'm not against uh, hunting. I think it's a very old and a fine way of, of uh, getting food. Uh, but we have to rethink how we see uh, to, in, in life other, other species in this world because we need them in, in ways we not even understand. For me, it's poor provocation. Sorry. No, it's no provocation. <laughs> I, I think <laughs> we have to take this serious because maybe you don't realize it, but we are right now in a shift of, of the minds. We recognize that we only are parts of the system, part of the, not, even, not even the crown. We are simply a, an important part, but we are part of the system. And, and we, we can't easily get rid of all the other parts and think it won't affect us. It will affect us. And the pandemic has showed us that it affects or is already affecting us. So, so what do you say, Sigulov? <coughs> yes, and um, I will just add to this that, that uh, if we have we have come to ver very close to a kind of uh, parenthesis, it's, it's not only about the climate, it's also about that we have uh, limited resources of, of agricultural land left and so on. Well, if, we, if we're looking at the global uh, uh, production of, of, of bio food, so to say, uh, it's only about 10% uh, left. Uh, we have taken uh, what, what is, is possible to take. And if we look at the weight of, of uh, human produced uh, things like cities and roads and so on, uh, two years ago that, that weight become, become larger than the weight of the biomass in the world. And if we look at birds and mammals, about 5% is uh, wild mammals like deer and elephants and whales and and such things. 36% is the weight of humans and 59% is the weight of our domesticated animals, pigs, uh, chicks and so on. So we have gone very far. Most people doesn't know this. We are, yes. we, we are, we are in the end, so to say. You say you I, think, um, I think you bring up a good point and I'm excited to try some of our, to, to watch some of our trials here and I'm going to this kind of leads us right into Trico. Um, what we have set up in, in some of our research for us and, uh, is we've done a commercial harvest two years ago. Then we are working with deer fencing. Then outside the deer fencing, we have a uh, uh, red oak plantation, or like, and then we've treated them with Trico. So we want to also watch here what is the, how can we work with the wildlife to help us, we protect the desired species with the trico, we let the browse on the other plant material around our desired species, while at the same time we're looking at the forest growing without in this wild state, what is going to happen to this understory and how does that, the growth of that understory affect the desired tree species, you know? So, so we, we, this, this is a tool that we have not had in the, in the United States yet that, that's effective. So uh, I'm, I'm really excited to, to meet everybody and to be here and to kind of share this experience uh, in real life. Thank you, Tom. Uwe, you have two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe one. There's there's no evidence that we are that we are able to extinct raw deer, 
And I, it's easy to say, you can't say, you, I, let's extinct raw deer. Nobody would say that. But what would be the price to accept a too high density of raw deer? Raw deer population and the, the, the size of raw deer population in Middle Europe is a consequence of forestry reducing uh, the rotation period f in regards to old growth forest, building roads in forests, all these kind of things that we need to do proper forestry to produce timber and other products through forests. So a higher population is a consequence of doing that. The price of having too high density of raw deer is in stable forestry ecosystems, not resilient forests and all these kind of a disconnect and a moving forward of ecosystems in a direction that is, from my perspective as, a, as an ecologist, not acceptable. And again, there is no evidence that we would be able to, to kill all rodents in Middle Europe. There's no, there's no, never ever a scientific fact that kind of underlines that you, you, you're supporting me. I mean, it hurts. I'm not in favor of killing animals. I don't like it, but I think the price for not doing it is by far too high. And as Sabrina said that in, in her uh, presentation, maybe if we have too much of, of the deers, we have less of other spe species. Yes. Other species are suffering. Maybe, is it, is it like this? Is it so? Well, it... it high deer population or has a high roe deer population can can have an impact on the whole ecosystem as as i said so we need to find a good good balance but if if you can solve one problem like reducing the damage uh, on on trees while at the same time having eco-friendly meat which which roe deer meat is which is very locally produced and especially in in the times of covid we have seen that is an increased interest in in game meat because it's locally um locally produced it's eco-friendly and this is what what people strive for nowadays mm -hmm. Stigulov, you, you were yes, I, I would also want to add uh, a little bit about the historical perspective to this discussion because uh, not long ago, uh, people in, in many European countries were starving, for example, in, in Sweden, in northern Sweden. And the populations of deer and moose, and the, I mean, the, the deer, uh, the road deer were almost becoming extinct. The moose didn't exist in northern Sweden. And uh, all of Europe, it was hunted down because people were hunting to getting food for the children on the table. And, and, and <laughs> then this oil came, and we could produce uh, uh, by oil and, and uh, fertilizers from f uh, phosphorus and so food in an enormous scale. Mm -hmm. but, but what will happen in the future if, if we don't can this anymore? What will happen to the, to the wildlife? Probably they, we will hunt them to, to have something to eat. I would, I would just uh, en along in the perspective on, on this. That was an interesting perspective. Uh, I think uh, Peter yes. wanted to add something? Uh, yes, uh, my duty is to say something at every session. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> in, in the club with Uwe. Yeah, 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 with Uwe, yes. That's good. <laughs> Special, <t> no. Um, <laughs> another, another controversial perspective in, in uh, all the issue about forests and, and wildlife is uh, how we treat uh, the deer in winter, that means feeding deer. And I would be interested in your perspectives, also mm -hmm. especially of face. How you, how you, what is your take on that? Because, I mean, there are some that say you should not do that. That would uh, lead to a regulation of the population automatically because there is only the natural way of uh, finding food in winter and would reduce the population. And the other, th so maybe others have also an opinion on that. And the other thing is, I mean, you, you've been talking a lot about um, meat uh, f f that you get for, uh, for a living. But I mean, that's only half of, 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 of the truth. I mean, the other truth is that uh, it's about the antlers and it's about uh, trophies uh, and trophy hunt. So there's a big incentive also for having a high population to doing that. So I would be interested in, in your take on these two aspects and to have a little bit more uh, diversity in the aspects uh, on, on wildlife and, and forests. We, we actively manage uh, deer wintering yards in Maine. So we would, we would have uh, specific, um, usually softwood cedar, cedar swamps uh, would, be, would be a good one. And we actually regulate those and, and maintain them as such in size and, 
and location. So okay, that's what we're doing. Uh, and uh, first, I have a question to 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 Flora. If if we had a um, two or three years ago, we had a winter with a lot of snow in the mm -hmm. south, and we had to uh, we had uh, deers who were in snow till the, to their heads. So um, the question was, let them die or give them food. What? What would you do in well, the situation if you have a lot of snowfall and, uh, and a bad yes. sit a bad winter? Would you feed them or or do you say, okay, this is nature? Well, I can maybe comment uh, on the thing. We will not uh, we will not feed roe deer, period. Mm -hmm. And um, historically driven, we do winter feed a red deer, of course, in the Alps because I mean they were in the past migrating out of the mountains in the winter time into the lower regions. So now there's agriculture, there's roads, there's cities and so on. If we want to keep them in the forest and minimize mm. the damage mm. to the uh, stands, then we have to come up with something. But, and here we go for your second question, uh, there's feeding and there's feeding. I mean, um, we are feeding in order for the population to survive the winter time, but we are not feeding in order to build up a population or to make the population grow bigger antlers, more ends, and so on. That's the main difference, and I totally agree. In the past, um, that system has been, well, perverted. Um, people are feeding roe deer all year round, um, calling it baiting. Uh, people are feeding uh, red deer from, well, the first snowfall until January 31st, end of hunting season. So you know the reasoning behind that. It's all about uh, getting the animals uh, presented to you on a silver platter. And that's not right. I mean, if you do a proper uh, red deer management, you, you feed them throughout the winter in order to... Uh, let them survive, but nothing else. Is is this a difference between Austria and Germany and Bavaria? Well, I guess you can speak according to the law, there probably isn't. But how it's done, there might be. But I mean, I, I can only speak for the for the state-owned forests in Bavaria. Private uh, hunting areas might be quite different. And I mean, every year we get the pictures of. Um, big mountains of food being brought out to support the animals so mm -hmm. yeah uh, sabrina yes to, to answer um, your question for me it's quite easy because face doesn't have a position uh, <laughs> there you go <laughs> luckily no because um yeah as i tried to explain before deer management or ungulate management was uh, just member state competence. So for FACE at European level, we, we didn't have to deal with it. This is our members and our members uh, deal with, with it them, themselves. So we don't have a position on, on winter feeding. <laughs> <laughs> I, yes. I would more connect to the second part with this trophy um, thing. I, I think this is something that we need to urgently overcome. I mean, the cultural setting that that I'm coming again from, from natural forest management and natural dynamics, resilient mm -hmm. forestry systems and things like that. How can we accept as a society uh, that forest that, that hunting is, is done based on, on trophies? I mean, for me, it's something that we urgently need to culturally overcome. And also the dis disconnect between the yeah. different laws that is connected. Hunting law connected to this kind of thing and the, then the forest law that is more back up through forest management perspectives. This is this is where our hunting quotas are state are mandated by the biologists. Mm -hmm. So okay. in a in in I but I to play into this, um, we we're it's illegal to for us to feed. Okay, it's illegal. Illegal. Okay. But on the on the feeding is also an interesting. If, if there is a need, I mean, nobody would like to answer better kill or, or let them die. This is also an impossible to answer uh, from yeah. an emotional perspective. Mm. But if yeah. if there is a need in extreme, repeatedly re extreme winter periods to feed, that I mean, what kind of indication do you need that you have an overpopulation? No. For well, me, it's a clear I'm indication there is an overpopulation yeah. because the density of of I'm talking only about raw deer at the moment, um, there is an overpopulation and someone has mm. not done its job properly. But 
my perspective the as an ecologist. The no, vari variability from winter to winter is so high, you can't imagine, really. Yeah, but it, and it, I, I can show you charts. But ecology is not a, an annual thing. Uh, yeah, yeah, you can ha <laughs> you can have an extremely warm winter with m with rain and an extremely cold winter. Yeah, welcome in the Darwin so Club. Sorry. I, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. If for me no. it's an indication of a much by far too high population, and then the consequence that is not in this particular winter to let yeah. them die or to feed no. them, but it's and more the conceptual. The conceptual question: What is your management perspective and your monitoring and your perspective on a, on an appropriate deer population in an area where you have occasionally these kind of winter okay. situations. Uh, we have a response yeah. also to this topic also from Johannes Quitzter who as a lot of people here is a hunter. Yes, yeah. um, and um, I think we, uh, we, we spoke uh, in, the, in, in these two days about um, good and bad forestry management and right now we also spoke about um, bad hunting management but there is also good hunting management. Um, with regards to um, preservation, and of course, black sheep are everywhere in forestry as well um, as, in, as in hunting. But um, there are also lots of hunters who take their, um, either their, um, their, their job or their, um, um, their kind of um, hobby or free time. Um, they're spending quite seriously in order to preserve and in order to find the right balance um, for their respective uh, hunting area they, they care for. And um, when it comes to differences, um, what, I, what I think to know is that there is quite a big difference between um, the culture of hunting in uh, continental Europe and in Scandinavia, for example, where this, uh, the question about the meat hunting and the trophy hunting is yeah, quite diverse all over Europe. And um, maybe um, you could also could, uh, could go... Yeah, uh, I, I, I will say that... In that. In, in southern Sweden, it could be that uh, some landowners uh, get a lot of money from the trophy hunting, but it's very rare. In, in, in the north or in Maine or, 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 or of Sweden, I would say that it's more for, for uh, meat or, and or for traditions and so on. But uh, the number of trophies, for example, from moose has uh, decreased a lot. The big antlers has gone because since the... the the forest company put the pressure on to, to shoot down the moose population. Then by chance, of course, uh, less and less of old moose survive to come up to that age when they produce large antlers. So we s it has just declined. That and are maybe we have in, 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 in the Central Europe the same, uh, same development, so that, that this kind of trophy thinking is more our generation and the new generation is not looking for, like, doesn't need a big car? Well, actually, that trophy thinking was, um, there was a movie, I think, about 40 years ago. It was about red deer. It was done by a German journalist. And um, I remember the opening statement from, the, from that movie, and it said, um, the question of the time is not to protect red deer. The question of the time is to shoot them. And that was a big uproar, of course, because... Um, well, until that time, we have been um, building up populations and thought that it was proper management. And that was the first time when um, actually the effects of um, damaged forests by red deer, I'm talking red deer now, um, came, came to light. And I think since then, at least in uh, forestry circles, there has been a shift in thinking but mm -hmm. I cannot well I cannot speak for uh, all forest service hunters and I cannot speak for all private hunters um, some people might uh, go out for trophy hunting and some people might go out because well they like to be in nature and some people um, do it because it's their job and um, what Johannes was saying there's also in uh, well with the private hunting community, there's a lot of people who um, actually manage their areas quite nicely and quite well. We should not forget that. But as we all know, once um, you actually manage a hunting area, it becomes hard work. And um, the line between yeah. a hobby and a job uh, <laughs> is quite blurry. 
And <laughs> um, especially sure. if you take into consideration what we have all been talking about, state of um, the regeneration, um, health of the forest, and so on, then we cannot talk about a hobby anymore. It becomes a job, and it becomes a 24-7 job <laughs> because you're basically doing nothing but hunting. <laughs> and hunting and preparing the hunt and butchering afterwards and um, chasing animals with the dogs that are wounded afterwards. So it becomes a really tough job. Mm -hmm. At we this point, yeah. I would like to close this. We no. I would like to add for the trophy hunting and for this discussion. Tom, you're allowed um, to do everything. Where, where we, where we uh, also differ here is in, at least for the moose in Maine, we will... Uh, we're also in charge of the, the, the ratios. So if we're trying to control the population, we're gonna, we're gonna give permits for females and less permits for, for the trophy, okay? And then we also will um, uh, have a lottery system and we'll also not shy for auctioning these off. <laughs> if you wanna buy a permit and, and shoot a moose in Maine, it's possible, but you, you have to pay us, you know? So anybody wants to come to Maine moose hunting, <laughs> I fix you it up for you. <laughs> okay. Anna. Well, we can see is that more young people hunt, and there are also more and more women that hunt in Sweden, and everything is not so uh, black and white because you can uh, hunt for traditional reasons and for getting meat and from maintaining the the wild life at the same time. And then you go out and you sit in a traditional way in the forest, and then all of a sudden it's a huge crown, and then you make a, a, what do you say, a trophy out of it, but that was not your intention, but since it's so beautiful, you do it, or the baits of the, of the wild boar. So I think it's, it can be a mixture of things too, not either or. Okay, that wa was interesting, maybe uh, are there any more questions here from the back? <coughs> yeah, um, I just want to sprinkle some oil <laughs> <laughs> in the fire. Um, I can relate to what uh, Florian uh, just said uh, with the 24-7 job. Um, I used to be a, a gamekeeper, a stalker um, at private estates. Um, so if we talk about um, rejuvenizing forests and hunting and putting up pressure in these areas so that this forest can come up. This is a really, really tough job mm. that most, um, let's sort of do it, part-time hunters are not up to. Um, the next thing is um, carnivores uh, do have an impact. That's at least my experience. And I've been out in the forest quite a, f quite a lot, um, especially on rhodia. Uh, Lynx has uh, decreased populations in several areas that I've been working. Okay. Um, not as much on, on, on red deer, for sure, uh, but fellow deer, roe deer, um, is highly affected of lynx. And um, hunting makes it much more difficult, especially in these dense areas where they can hide. So putting up pressure in these areas um, for someone who sits like two evenings or two mornings per week uh, will not uh, fulfill the job. Well, that's the time when you when you hunt those areas, um, whether it's lynx or well, some areas where wolves are pretty well. There's or there is a lot high numbers of wolves. Um, you're pretty much um, doomed when you do single hunting by yourself. I mean, that actually ties in with what I said earlier. Um, we have to rely more on these communal hunts and driven hunts and make those more effective. That's at least our experience. Okay, an impression from Switzerland. Exactly, and uh, just to, to confirm uh, what, what was said before, in, in Switzerland, I mean, there are not so many wolves, but in areas where there is a pack of wolves, uh, you see an impact uh, in the forest. And maybe not even because the number of, of deer, deer uh, deers goes down so much, but they are more cautious, they move around more quickly. So this may have an impact already. So I, I think uh, we shouldn't rule out uh, the, the large predators. And, and the impact in which direction? In which way is the so impact? So that, that, that there were, was less damage on, on young trees. Oh, less browsing. Yes, exactly. Hey, more wolves. 
<laughs> More links. This is what links. I heard. Ah. <laughs> Thank you. This was. I very think. Nice. If, may I contribute to what you said? I think that would be a forward-looking debate whether it's appropriate as a society to accept hobby hunting versus kind of having the the responsibility to discuss publicly kind of new concepts, professional hunters, whatever kind of thing, because it's a 24-7 job. And if we need to, if we seriously look forward for more resilient forests, we need to have be open-minded for this debate because it, it has somehow limits where we are at the moment and how we are behaving or have the, the agreed concept is as a, at its limits, I would say. Uh, Therefore, I, I fully support what you said. A last one. At the same time, though, we need private hunters in order to, um, well, fill our ranks in the communal hunts. I agree with that, but we need to have this discussion a bit more public. Yes. Okay. If you can, it's a good thing if you can agree. Uh, this is a very interesting discussion. We will proceed outside. Uh, now, uh, last question for to sum up a little bit what we are uh, talking about uh, at each uh, of the panelists. Um, what is your um, call for action if you think of deers and uh, reforestation and deer management? If you no, let's start with Uwe. I mean, I <laughs> said it's hunting, but it maybe if I reconsider. Yeah, think about what yeah, the others are yeah, yeah. telling you. I think it's more keeping our our focus mm -hmm. on resilient forestry in regards to climate okay. change and and in germany that would mean beside hunting as much as possible raw deer it would be maybe kind of opening up for a for forward looking debate between the contradiction for the contradiction uh, to solve the contradiction between forest law and hunting law okay okay florian what's your well, if, we're action. if we talk in hunting, um, we should seriously use all the possibilities given to us by law. Um, we should uh, invest into new hunting technologies. We should invest into new hunting techniques. Um, for example, climbing tree stands for us has been a, well, a success story in driven hunts. But that's something that's fairly new. But we have to keep an open mind and adapt to that. Stig Ulof? Yes, once again, um, I think the most important thing is that we start at least to discuss some kind of rules or legislations about how to regenerate forests. Because we have, uh, of course, in many places in Europe, also in Sweden, uh, mixed forests coming after, allowed to come uh, after the, the cutting. But, but uh, in many places, it's just uh, a few percent to see these trees left, uh, especially in northern Sweden. And this uh, conifer monocultures, we have to stop with this because it has such a dramatic effect on many ecological services, um, climate resilience, uh, uh, the possibility to have a uh, well medium large uh, moose uh, production, and so on. So I, uh, th this is my my main uh, uh, say message that start to discuss some. Uh, some rules for, for regeneration of already uh, clear-cut areas. Then we'll solve many problems in uh, once. Okay. Tom? Yeah, I, I can go along with this. I think, I think having... having um, I also like the ability to um, live, leave each geographical area to their own specific uh, targets. However, having more stratification in the forest, um, more diameter classes, more diversity in stand structure, I think is very important, you know? And, and I think that we can do this in a, uh, we, ha we can do this and maintain the monetary values along with the biodiversity values, you know? And somehow there's that uh, ability to naturally regenerate and still manage these stands. Um, Going back to the first speaker too, uh, I can relate to this in, along the coast of Maine, managing a lot of coastal properties and having vibrant, um, uh, strong, stable stands and, and quantifying the value of these uh, shoreland and riparian zones. But at the end of the day, having multiple uh, variations of species and size of retention trees. Okay, that's cool. 
Sabrina. Yes, I, I think a lot of good things already have been said, but for us it's mainly the integration of wildlife management into the forest management plans, open dialogue, um, but also forward thinking. If, if you um, yeah, reforest areas, think already ahead how we can support the hunting community to have a good, good impact on uh, on the deer populations, and I'm thinking about hunting corridors or facilitating hunting opportunities, but also looking at, at the biodiversity of forest ecosystems, uh, creating uh, resting zones, creating uh, alternative grazing and browsing um, areas. So I think, yes, if we find good cooperation, if there's good dialogue um, and regular dialogue to analyze the damage, uh, we, we, will we can create, uh, yeah, climate resilient and future fit forests. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Dear audience, please, a big round of applause <laughs> for our panelists. <laughs> Thank you very much for being here. You can, I, I just need a minute more. You can uh, sit down. Uh, we have now, uh, we'll have uh, our coffee break for 10 minutes. And at uh, three, a quarter past three, we, uh, we start with our next inspirational journey. We have uh, s three stands. Uh, the first one is an introduction to Trico, hosted by Gary Chobling and Alicia Wurr were from Quitsta Agro. Then we have another results of American academic studies about Trico, hosted by Julia Hengel uh, from Quitsta Agro Biological Development. And uh, we have Trico and the inspirational journey to restore the American chestnut tree to its native range, hosted by Brian Roth. You will know him from Roth Forestry Research. And of course, you can meet our panelists in person. So have a nice time. We see you later. See you in about an hour. See you. Goodbye.